Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ died to sin once for all, and now he lives to God. Let us renew our resolve to have done with all that is evil and confess our sins in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is my help and salvation. way to Jerusalem, Jesus travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. In our Bible reading from Luke chapter 17, Jesus is travelling south from Galilee to Jerusalem. 
He's on the outskirts of a village when he encounters 10 lepers. Last week we were thinking and praying for the leprosy mission. But leprosy in biblical times was a bit more general than it is today. It was a name given to a variety of diseases, some curable and some not. In its worst form, it was greatly dreaded. It could be uh, indirectly disfiguring and fatal. And the ancient world's only defense against it was quarantine. You had to separate from everyone else. Now, until the last couple of years, many of us wouldn't really know what that feels like, but COVID has kind of changed that. We have all experienced uh, limits being placed on us. Some of us have had to isolate from others even from members of our own family. It's been difficult, but imagine having to do that for the rest of your life. In the film Ben-Hur, the hero's mother and sister get leprosy and are forced to live with others in a leper colony to prevent accidental contact with the general population. They were required to call out unclean if they, were, if they ever left uh, that, uh, that colony. Such people had no way of earning a living and had to depend on charity. In addition to this, they were regarded as richly unclean, defiled, unfit for temple worship. This was a disease that people were ashamed of, even though it was no fault of their own. So these 10 people did not have just to contend with ill health. They also had to contend with poverty and with being outcasts, excluded from every aspect of society. At the sight of Jesus, they keep their distance. They do, however, shout for help. Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Perhaps they're not directly asking to be healed. Uh, maybe they were wanting uh, money. But the, they may have heard of Jesus' other mirac miracles, and maybe they were uh, hoping that Jesus' mercy would extend to their physical healing. Well, Jesus, attracted by their calls, does a very strange thing. He doesn't touch them or even come to them. Instead, he tells them simply to go as they are and show themselves to the priests. Why did Jesus tell them to do this and not just heal them on the spot? Is he frightened of catching a disease himself? No, Jesus was testing their faith by asking these uh, men to act as if they'd been cured. Now, in J Jewish society, the priest acted as a kind of health inspector to certify that people were cured. And if a person uh, thought they had overcome a particular illness, which uh, separated them from the rest of the community, then they would go to the priest for a checkup and permission to be let back into the community. Glad we don't do that today, and I'm sure the people of Wiston are as well. There are no long queues outside of the vicarage for people wanting permission to go about their business. We're told by Luke that they obeyed Jesus' instructions, and as they did so, it happened. As they went, they were cleansed. Having heard Jesus' words, they step out in faith. Sometimes God does test our faith in order for us to grow in our relationship with him. Sometimes we need to act in faith on a particular issue or situation. But it's important to discern when God might be challenging us in this way and when he's not. This passage is not teaching that we should throw away our medicines or other health aids and simply claim healing. Nor is it saying that if only we had enough faith, then we would be cured from our physical diseases, which might afflict us. That sort of teaching is at best wrong, at worst cruel. It only raises false hopes in people, but then when they don't show signs of healing, they blame themselves for a lack of faith. I've even had some Christians say to me that if we all had more faith, we could simply walk into hospitals and everyone would be cured. Now that's simply not true. And I'm not showing a lack of faith in saying that. There were plenty of lepers who died at the time of Jesus. God does not promise us a life freed from physical hardship. Very often God may use that hardship to test our faith and develop our relationship with him. You see, if we read this passage carefully, the emphasis of this test of faith is not so much the men acting on what they were told and going to the priest, important though that was, the emphasis, the test, is what they do in response to their healing. Jesus didn't just send them to the priest to see if they would go. He also sent them to see if they would come back. As they went, they were cleansed. But what happens?
Nine continue merrily on their way, and one man returns to thank Jesus. He doesn't wait for the priest to say he's cured, or wait until he's accepted back in society. When he sees that he's been cured, he immediately returns to thank Jesus. He comes back praising God in a loud voice. He knew God was responsible for what had happened in his life, and he wanted everyone to know it. Uh, if people do not give thanks quickly, they usually do not do so at all. I'm sure uh, you can think of times when you said to yourself, I must thank so-and-so for doing that, and you mean to thank them, but you never quite get round to it. Now, if that's true of how we treat others, how much more true is it of how we treat God? This man was truly thankful uh, for what God had done in his life. He directs his praise in the most appropriate way. He gives thanks to Jesus. In fact, he does more than that. He prostrates himself in humility before his master. He's not putting on an act or seeking to draw attention to himself. This is a spontaneous action from the heart. He's full of gratitude and praise. No doubt the other nine were pleased with what had happened. They may even have recognised God's hand in it. May have gone to the temple at some point to thank God, but there's no record of them returning to say thank you to Jesus. Maybe they put it off, maybe they forgot. I suspect they were too busy enjoying their newfound freedom. Doesn't that have echoes with you and me? God answers our prayers, but instead of thanking him, we just move straight on down the shopping list. This is what I want next. Like these nine individuals, it's easy for us to enjoy the blessings and forget to thank God for all he's done for us and all he's given. We can also forget to be thankful to one another. But before we leave this passage, there is a bit of a sting in the tail. Out of the ten lepers, only one returns, and we're told the one who returns was a Samaritan. Now, in our culture, the word Samaritan has a very positive image. There are people who listen and help those in difficulty. This, of course, is based on Jesus' story of the good Samaritan who helped the man who'd been violently mugged on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. But for the Jews of Jesus' day, the word Samaritan had a very negative connotation. They were looked down upon and disliked. Samaritans were not people who answered telephones. They were half Jews. They were descended from the time when Israel was divided into two kingdoms. The southern kingdom was ruled from Jerusalem and the northern kingdom set up a kind of alternative government. So when the northern kingdom fell, those who were not killed or deported intermarried with pagan tribes. So they were kind of half Jewish and Samaritans and Jews were at loggerheads ever since. As far as uh, the Jews were concerned, this man was outcast with or without leprosy. It's a mark of, of the horror of the disease that we find leprous Jews and Samaritans sharing the same company with each other because neither could find place within their own community. This man should have been, in, in some ways, the last of the ten to give thanks to a Jewish teacher and healer, but he's the first and only one. And we can get a picture of something of the sense of disappointment in Jesus towards the other nine he healed by the question he asks. Weren't all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Didn't anyone return to give praise to God except this foreigner? Now, Jesus isn't being racist there. He's simply pointing out that in many ways, the other nine should have responded even more than this man. This man shows the others up by his gratefulness. The importance of being grateful to God for what he has done for us is such an important lesson for us. It's a lesson which comes out even stronger as we notice the place where Luke has inserted this incident in his book. Uh, the miracles of Jesus are not randomly thrown into any of the Gospels. They're carefully chosen and carefully placed. And this miracle comes in the middle of a section of Jesus' teaching and a section of incidents which focus on those who accept him and those who reject him. At the end of chapter 13, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem because he sees they will reject him. In the next chapter, there then follows a challenge to the self-important religious leaders. Jesus tells a story about a great feast where those who were invited make excuses not to come. And so others are invited instead. In chapter 15, we read uh, three of Jesus' most famous stories about a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost or prodigal son. The last story 
is the most famous of all, but it's really about two sons, the wayward son who returns, but then the older son who should have rejoiced when his brother uh, returns is instead filled with jealousy and rage. Really, he represents the religious leaders. And the story finishes with him outside of the party. Will he join in or stay in the cold? In chapter 16, there are, are more teachings and challenges to the Pharisees and the important people of society. Then we come to the passage we read today. Ten lepers, only one returns, and he is Samaritan. This miracle sums up the whole of what Jesus has been saying, both to his followers and to the Pharisees. Both groups have been given the immense privilege of hearing God's message from God himself, from Jesus. The Pharisees do not respond to this privilege with acceptance and gratitude, and they rep represent the majority, the nine who don't return. But always there are some who do respond wholeheartedly. I tell you, says Jesus, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Those who might have been expected to respond did not respond. Those who might not have been expected to respond did respond. And that's both a challenge and an encouragement to us. Firstly, looking at our own lives, it's a challenge against complacency, taking God for granted and assuming everything's OK. It's a challenge to us also to be thankful, genuinely thankful for all that God has done in our lives. But maybe you're listening and you're feeling the exact opposite of that. How can God accept me? How can he want to know me? And if that's you, then be encouraged. You're exactly the sort of person Jesus is looking for. He cares so much that he left everything else on hold to come after you. But after looking at ourselves, we also need to look at our town and the world that we live in. And again, we face the challenge that many, the majority, will reject our message. Many will want to ignore Jesus. Many, after encountering him, will move on. Even those we might expect to respond may not. There will be disappointments, but also be encouraged. There will be a hunger for God from totally unexpected quarters. And when it happens, we have to give God the glory because he did it. There are countless books about people whose lives have been turned around by Jesus, and there are living books in our church family. Each of us has a story to tell. But finally, as we think of this miracle, let's return to the one who made it possible. Let's say thank you to Jesus. Let's recapture the gratitude which was in our hearts when we first believed. As we pray now, let's return to the feet of Jesus as the, that Samaritan did all those years ago. And let's pray together. I'm just going to ask that we pause for a moment's silence as we think about things we want to thank Jesus for today. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great love for us, a love which took you to the cross and which secures for us everlasting life. And we thank you for the many blessings that you bestow on us day by day, some of which we are all too aware of, others perhaps which we just take for granted. Help us, Lord, to reflect on your great goodness for us and to say thank you. We ask this in your name. Amen.
Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we just have a moment's silence as we bring before God anything we particularly wish to pray for. We ask all of these things in the name and for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we join in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Unnumbered blessings give my spirit. God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.